now. Another live episode of Hidden Horsepower. You can check out all the episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, all of that, TotalSeal.com website. Warren Johnson, the professor of pro stock, 97 wins, six championships, six indies, and a book that is already in its second printing and a bestseller on Amazon's automotive history section. WJ, welcome back. How are you? I'm just fine. More importantly, how are you? I am tired. Well, that's a good thing. I, my brain has like been absorbing all this information <laughs> all day you long. Actually, work today? I sat and I, I listened <laughs> oh. and I absorbed. <laughs> I absorbed information from some of the best out here at the Engine Performance Expo. But I want to, I, like, the information makes me want to do something. I want to put it to use. That's something you've done your entire life. Put information to good use. As they say, get her done. Get her done. Well, right. he is the king of the one-liners and the sayings. <laughs> yeah. Right? We even immortalized it from last year. He had the line, you can't tune it up if you blew it up. Yep. So we, we immortalized you this year in the commemorative Engine Performance Expo t-shirt hope you don't mind me taking license to steal that from you not a problem we'll give you one right <laughs> exactly and you know what another one just happened on a recent episode we had one of your uh, former crew members employees gary stennett on the show and we were talking about uh machining and he he said when, when talking about the modern technology he said you know warren told me you can be a, mach a machine operator or you can be a machinist and he was talking about the feel and the sound and all of that like personal connection to the machine and what it was uh, what it was doing and the best way to get a finish. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I always look at it. A real machinist can take a bad machine and build perfect parts. A machine operator can take a perfect machine and build bad parts. And that's the difference between a machinist and a machine operator. And I there's your shirt. For <laughs> exactly. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> New shirt. So there you go. Right. So you've been in the news lately. The book comes out. It was uh, we promoted it at the last Engine Performance mm -hmm. Expo, and it took a little bit longer to get to print. But then it got to print, and it flew off the shelves, and it's already in its second uh, printing, which is rare. But people want to know about Warren Johnson. What was that like for you? Well, you know, I really I've seen a lot of the responses. Well, the only ones they show me are the positive ones. I haven't seen <laughs> the negative ones. But uh, it was different. I, you know, I never felt that I was worthy of a book at this point in time yet I really haven't done all that much I, I yeah. raced a car for a living and that's basically what it did I, I raced for a living instead of going out there and trying to make a, a name for myself so I, I figure yeah, you don't need to put the, the cart before the horse is the way I've always looked at it you know if you if you do a good job people will notice things will go uh, go the right direction well, I highly recommend everybody out there get it. You can get it on Amazon.com. There's a lot of nuggets and storylines. And for me, uh, as a fan, and you know that, fan of you and Kurt for many years before I started working in the industry, so this is kind of a big deal for me always, and you, you know, bust my chops from time to time, but I love it. But for me, the best parts were, you know, young Warren, like building walls of snow so that you had an engine uh, room that you could build engines in and it's like 30 below like that was alien to me being from Florida like you did whatever you had to do to pursue what you wanted to pursue and that's what makes it a big deal that's basically called survival uh, my brother and I we take a lot of mechanical work on in the winter time and uh, didn't have a shop that big to put anything in so we had to work outside so you just walled off vehicles with snow and crawl underneath them and Overhauled engines, did whatever you needed to do. Besides, hell, we cut pulpwood, trapped uh, weasels and animals and whatnot. You just did whatever it took to, you know, have some economic benefit from it. Uh, sitting in a, a welding chair in 30 below, welding. Welding sling. <laughs> welding sling, making, uh, you know. Welding structural steel. Not enough not enough money to, to live the life you wanted to live, but you did it, and yep. you were doing it. Back then, it was a whole dollar and 39 cents an hour. People can't even imagine working for that uh, wage, but my wife and I, she worked, I worked. Went and bought a brand new Camaro, turned it into a pro stock car. You know, you did whatever you needed to do. You didn't uh, wait for the government to give you a handout. And, well, and that's the lesson that right. you, and that's why they wrote a book about you. Like, that's the reason, right. is that you came from 
hardworking, humble beginnings, but ended up as the professor of pro stock, a person who is at least within an industry, famous and uh, revered. Well, I'll put this way, I guarantee you that same dedication he put into building walls of snow so you could do machine work, you did that into building engines. Well, because I enjoy anything mechanical and uh, you know, the building of the engine is, is the simplest part of it. Thinking your way through the process of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to accomplish it, mm -hmm. that's the interesting part and the right. part that I actually enjoyed. Well, and let's, uh, you know, not to, to give away the Gary Stinnett Hidden Horsepower coming up on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, but that he gave you credit for that as well. And, uh, and some other folks he worked with, it's not what to think about, it's how to think about. That was the, the ultimate lesson that enabled him to continue his career. And I'd like to try to illuminate on that a little bit, like how to think. There are people who are in their shops right now or watching this in the, in the future. How to solve a problem is not about you know what it is, it's a method of how to think about the solution. Well, can, you, can you go there? First and foremost, uh, Newtonian physics is not gonna change in our lifetime. The so, rules of the universe are set. Yep, they're they're set. You know, God set them, and they're 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 done. there for life. You really have to understand a problem before you can solve it. Most of them are really not that difficult. People think themselves into non-functional situations, and you yeah. look at something. You know, it's really not that difficult. I got to go from there to there. Easiest thing is a straight line. Got a few obstacles in between. Well, you just get rid of them. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, it's, just, it's that applying yourself, right? I think that's what you're saying is that you have to think about that bigger picture, not just, well, there's an obstacle, I'm done, or maybe a convoluted way around the obstacle. But the biggest part of uh, success is that you have to accept failure on the way. Mm. But if you look at, okay, say you've got 10 processes you're gonna go through to do whatever. If you succeed at one, you got nine failures. You know, pure math and instinct would say you better learn from the failures than from the one good part. Yeah, yeah. there you go. That's back to the Edison thing we mentioned earlier, is that you learn from all those failures. You, you have to learn from everything. And you can't be afraid to try something. Oh, you can't be afraid to fail. I mean, failure is just a, Part of life, right? Nobody's going to be perfect 100% of the time. Nobody hits a home run every time. Oh, well, true, right? I mean, even Barry Bonds and those guys—they <laughs> still miss the ball every once in a while, yeah. you know. Well, I, I think part of that makes me kind of think about today's age, where people expect things to be perfect out of the box. You do something new, you expect it to be spot on. And what I'm hearing you say is that's really a not realistic expectation. Well, first it, of all, you have to uh, define uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect is only the amount of error you're willing to accept. Ooh, that's another good one. Okay, somebody writing this stuff down. <laughs> right, somebody you know, recording this or something. Or <laughs> I mean, coming up I mean, with a gold, and we got to be jotting it down. Fortunately, it will be uh, archived forever. Let's go back to that Camaro. And I, I don't want to talk so much about it, but um, you. You know, the DRCE competition engine, Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, all of that. But, you know, you started out with just a, a factory car that you went and bought and modified it. And that that was, in, from what I learned, the bridge. Like, without that car, the Warren we know doesn't uh, emerge. Carrying around on a flatbed, like a tow truck. You know, everybody's got to start someplace. Nowadays, you got... Uh a lot of wherewithal that your parents, grandparents give you, so they put them in a driver's seat, expect them to be a pro stock racer just because they got enough money. That doesn't make them a racer. And there's a difference between a racer and a driver. A racer will do everything it takes to get to race. A driver just combs their hair and whatever and gets in a driver's seat every four, uh, six seconds. Nah, it's just. Things are different nowadays. I'm not saying it's any better, any worse. It's just different. It's different. Well, the modern technology, the uh, things have been created now that didn't even exist back then. But boy, I bet I bet, uh, I bet some of them would have helped you back then. If there was modern technology uh, of today available then, like what would you have liked to have access to? Like machines like we're talking about, 
you know, tire technology. There's so many different things that have evolved and advanced over the years. Well, I guess you could just say that uh, the calculator is definitely faster than a slide rule. Yes. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. but you really should understand a slide rule before you just assume hitting buttons is going to give you the correct answer. Right. You know, it's like when you read a book, the first thing you do is find out what the author is all about. Because if somebody's got time to write a book, that means they're probably unemployed for some reason. <laughs> Except when it was your book, because I know yeah, Kelly. I didn't write it. Kelly, right? Right? <laughs> I know Kelly. Yeah, Kelly. Kelly's got like six very, very hard, difficult, uh, challenging jobs. I would say she was probably the best person to pick to uh, write that book because a, she loves pro stock. I've known her for quite a uh, bit of the time, and I'd have to say she was the best uh, person to do the dirty work, so, shall we say. And probably mortified that we're speaking about her because she just loves to play the back. But <laughs> since we are, though, like, what a great job she did. And yes, is there anyone that loves pro stock more than, than Kelly Wade? Not from the literary side of it. She, she absolutely, I think that's her favorite category. You know, I've seen her time. over the last, I don't know, 10 plus years. And she's always come around, always has a great personality and always interested in what we're doing and the process you know you Arlene Kurt like they, she was with you she became part of the family oh, uh, yes. going to by you know you go to the same restaurant every day for dinner except for Sunday or one day a week the seventh day Tuesday Tuesday Mexican the seventh day where you go to Mexican <laughs> right <laughs> creature of habit uh, to a certain extent excellent but I like to eat good and we don't want to say where it is because right. we don't no. want you to lose can't, your can't uh, spoilers, you know, no. table or, or anything like that but just giving up your life to uh, someone you have to trust them you have to trust that they're gonna do something right and you guys broke out photographs and Arlene had um, documented so much did you know that she had all of that yeah I, I guess in the back of my mind I knew she had all of that and I have to give her credit for saving all that because that's what made the book is a, it made it more of a personal picture of my life where you know they could see where I came from how I evolved to where, uh, what I was and what I am and so it, it gives me a pretty good history of, of myself and Arlene and Kirk too. Young Warren was pretty cool too when you guys hanging out like it wasn't uh, I don't you know I don't want to say this the wrong way but the professor was a different image than what I saw with uh, young Warren out on the tour, kind of spending some time, saw some lawn chairs out there in the pits. Kind of a different era of drag racing, though. You must have read a different part of the book that I did. I, I was looking <laughs> into those photographs, man. It looked like you were having a really good time. Oh, I, I enjoy life. Don't get me wrong. I mean, <laughs> we only get one trip at this deal, so you better enjoy it. Yes, yes. I still think he would like to have one of these EM69s in the 80s or 70s. Oh, yeah, I'd probably be up seven or eight inches taller. It's wore me down to this. <laughs> <laughs> you were six foot back in the day, right? <laughs> Absolutely. My story. All right, so you're also in the news because one of your protégés, Greg Anderson, just got 98 wins, and you've had 97 wins. You've told us in the past that, and he's told us, that you know you guys are connected in many ways like he doesn't get 98 wins without working for warren johnson and you he was part of your 200 mile per hour run what is what has that been like to kind of like watch it happen and see his competition like really fight him for it it took a long time two-thirds of the season but he finally got there well i'm uh, glad he finally got there because he, you know he's spent 20 years trying to achieve that and uh it took him 165 races to get 97 wins i did it in 151 races uh, you know, it's just a different way of doing things. I came from a different era of racing as, to po uh, as opposed to what it is nowadays. I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other one. It's just that it's different. And, you know, Greg got to be proud of, uh, you know, getting 98 wins. Well, you've got a great heritage. I mean, a guy like Greg that worked for you, a guy like Gary that worked for you, it's, you look at, the, that's what, in the pro football, they call it the coaching tree. Yes. All the guys that work for Bill Walsh. I mean, they, those guys revolutionized the NFL. So Bill ha had his Super Bowls, but then all of his protégés have other Super Bowls and stuff. So you got to be proud of the, they obviously learned something from you along the way. Well, in a lot of cases, they learned what not to do. But that was part of the education. Right, you know. right. Uh, they took what I had done, because 
You know, my dad wouldn't even go to a race. He called it vehicle exp uh, abuse. Uh, abuse. Really? And okay. It's he wouldn't even go to a race. So I, uh, you know, I had to kind of learn this whole trade uh, on the fly, so to speak. And Greg saw a lot of things that I did wrong, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that he recognized it and you know picked up on it and didn't uh, commit those errors. Right. But that's that's the price of education, and you know they, a lot of guys refer to it as w, uh, WJ University. Guys, nah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And it's, I'm happy to teach anything anybody, almost any, anything I know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Hold back some a little bit, right? Well, yeah. You know, they don't want to load the gun before. We shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> and there were commercials, right? The Professor of Pro Stock. Yeah, those good wrench commercials for a while in front of the schoolhouse, and that was uh, like think about that, and maybe, unfortunately, part of the, a slight back step of drag racing. It's like you used to flip on the TV, and there would be commercials with Warren Johnson on them. Right. And I, I just thought that was the best as a drag racing fan. It's like, look at this. And they, you're in a schoolhouse and you're teaching kids, and I think they were probably unruly. Kids unruly? Yeah. Uh, Never not happens. if I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that know, was filmed out in California. You know, you're talking, it makes me think back to when you came to Total Seal to do the AERA event, which, I mean, it probably was six, seven, eight years ago. It's yeah, been a while, been right? While, yeah. You're talking, and you're like you are now and i'm listening and i'm like man this guy is cut from the same cloth as my father <laughs> i think i went over and told you that afterwards. like i i get you man i i get you because y'all are cut from the same cloth that racer mentality it's a little brutal but it gets the job done but that's what it takes though i mean it's like you said you know, there's a race car driver but there's a racer my dad was a racer like you he was going to do whatever it took to make it happen focus yes and just relentless grinding away. It's like if you go find, I guarantee you, even though it's you know probably almost about five o'clock now, he's still at his shop in the dino room back there working on go kart stuff because he whipped her butt not long ago. But he knows there's a bigger track coming up next time, and he ain't done yet. He's enjoying life. He is loving it. Well, isn't that what it is? Mm -hmm. Like you found something that you really like. You wouldn't be able to put that much. Like if you were in the welding sling. Could you have possibly put that much like love and determination into it? No. When you absolutely enjoy what you love, it's not a job, it's an opportunity. Yep. And you will expand your horizon, so to speak, education, whatever, to be successful at it. Right. Yeah. Because you don't want to do what something else. You no, no, did. no, 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 exactly. I, I want to do this. So, so what made you? choose pro stock i mean versus top fuel man that, that's the the big show right is the fuel go. cars i mean that's uh what what big show <laughs> here we go get them more <laughs> okay. mechanical masochists using chemistry <laughs> no uh, every vehicle out there has a, a purpose it's just naturally aspirated uh, stuff appeal to me i figure if, if you got to use a power adder to something you obviously didn't build the engine right to start with Okay, yeah, so we started a whole fight on Instagram not long ago because Keith Duckworth, you know, from Cosworth, yeah. entered the, the DFV, right, the most successful engine in Formula One history, said turbochargers are for people who can't build engines. Absolutely. And I put it up there because I'm kind of with you. I love NA engines. I'm like, yeah, get, give me an NA engine because then there's nothing for free. You got to fight and claw for everything. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that. Maybe it's masochistic. I don't know, but I love it. Uh, I mean, you know, fuel cars are cool to watch. I mean, let's, let's be honest, right? I mean, yeah, well, you, what'd you call it? Oh, them? I appreciate the numbers Circus. they put up on a uh, board. You know, for a friction-driven vehicle, uh, those are pretty remarkable numbers, right. ETs and speeds that they run. But, you know, when you got to rebuild it after uh, three seconds, <laughs> I don't think that's a, a real way to run a railroad. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of work, too. Hey, see, you, you see all your work just evaporate like that. That's, that's, that's a bit redundant much. work, is what yeah. that is. Well, it's like short track racing, man. It's, it's fun, man, but you got to fix your race car every single week because you're going to tear your stuff up. Ain't hey, no doubt about that. Yeah. So, it, it, I, the, I can get some of this drag racing thing now. I can start to catch on. It's like, wait, I worked on this. I can just keep kind of massaging your, the same thing. Depends and, on your definition of fun. Right, I guess so. So the last time we had you in, we got to a point where we started talking about 
uh, you know, some of the, the valve train issues, and that's where you, you had said that you know just so many challenges lie, and you said, but I solved it. And but then NHRA wouldn't let you do it, right? And that was oh, yeah. just the, the, the pneumatic valve train, and that just sparked with me. And I just got to thinking about like how many other things were there that Warren mm -hmm. had gone down the road, and then you know someone was at the end of the the road saying, "No, no, no don't go here, don't go here, sir." Uh, you know the pneumatic valve train for Pro Stock. We spoke earlier about a uh, fuel injection, and Roy Johnson was saying that they should have gone to fuel injection, you know, five, ten years before they did. And I said that you had been mentioning it since the early 1990s when 1989 to be exact and and you know that's when cart and all the other major forms of auto racing were like making their mm -hmm. transition and the oes were making their transition and you were right on it then why i had done a development job uh, kurt and i did a development job for a kickoff for marine mm -hmm. for their offshore uh, shore race program 500 cubic inches whatnot and they were making, I think, about 775 horsepower at the time. But they couldn't turn it over 7,500. And when the prop comes out of the water, bad things happen. Yep. <clears throat> so they called me and asked me if I could help them. And I said, well, I can sure give it a try. And they asked me what kind of power a 500 cubic inch fuel injected EFI inje uh, engine, unlimited compression ratio should make I said thousand horsepower easily you know about 40 seconds later he picks the phone up again and are you sure I said yeah our first hit on it was 985 horsepower before we even got to tune it up because Kurt and I had not the foggiest idea about EFI right <clears throat> and the guy from DFI kind of walked us through the thing to get it and by the end of the day we had I think 10 1035 or something like that right you put it in the boat Reset the record by 20 miles an hour and outlawed the engine on the spot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> outlawed the engine on the spot. Yeah, so that's, you know, my definition of a boat is a hole in the water. You throw money into it. That cured me there. <laughs> wow. We talk about raising that bar and getting pistoled. You know, like Roy said well, earlier, that was it, right? You, you, you pushed it too far. There it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, killed it. But, you, you know, that's where you thought, hey, we should do this in drag racing. How are you... Uh, programming like nowadays it's so easy with the you know, you're just on the computer but back then in 1988 computer computers weren't uh, uh, basically the same okay a little slower but basically the same you dealt in 200 r uh, 50 rpm blocks and you still control all the, all eight injectors and whatnot and you looked at the uh, o2s and mapped it they responded a lot slower so you had to kind of lead it by about 400 rpm all the time so mm. but it was basically the same thing it was, Nothing really uh, earth sh uh, shattering. Uh, today's ECUs are so much faster, and they got rid of uh, a lot of the junk as far as uh, the pro stock ECU. You know, we don't need the heated and air conditioning seats or power windows or convertible top operating. So it's pretty simple. It's straightforward. Yeah, yeah. just does what we need. Yeah. So what about other, uh, you know, crazy Warren Johnson concepts that some rule maker said, dude? No. Uh, I did a looking for RPM. I did a twin twin cam engine. Okay. okay. There we go. But the camshafts were in the block. Okay. Twin the lifters cam were in, in the, the cylinder block. head. Push rod was about an inch and a quarter long. Okay. Run about fourteen thousand RPM on a spintron. I don't know. They outlawed that for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was going to be for because it was a push rod. It was still technically a push rod engine. Oh, yeah, absolutely, kind of like the Indy car engine that Elmore did, right? Yep. One run, done. Yep. Outlawed after one race. Because see that that's the kind of stuff that makes for, for me interesting. Oh God, I, I have it. When I got to go visit uh, Elmore in yep. the UK a couple of years ago, they had one of those engines mm -hmm. on display in the lobby. May I, I? I got a selfie next to it because that's I love that. That's me. I'm like, yes, that's cool. That's well, racing. Total innovation, right, which is something that has unfortunately been... Think outside the box. Outlawed and locked. Crush it. Rock arm on one end, a finger follower on the other, and against the camshaft. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I mean, it, was, it was nice. Okay, where is that? Do hmm? you still have that? That engine? Yeah. No. That's... We scrapped it. That would be so cool to see right now. 
it was it just a regular be. block. We just machined everything out and yeah. made yeah, an insert. Still, though, right, yeah. Right. yeah, we just put a couple of cams in there. It's lovely. It's no big deal. Right. So, all right. So, <laughs> Hartford tells me this story back related to this machine that you and Kurt would, in one week, digitized, machined, and dynoed, what, five sets of cylinder heads? Mm, like back there to back. There may like, have yeah. been some changes in, uh, just on uh, one cylinder, uh, set of cylinder heads. May have been two or three changes to one, but we, yeah, we've run a lot of parts across the dyno. Or you could like, literally with a machine like this, you go in there and say, hey, I can take this head, I can dyno it, I can go make a change on that head, put it back on the engine and re-dyno it, and basically do all that in a day. The beauty of the software that we have in the Rottler is the fact that I can go change any part of the porting operation, intake exhaust chambers, just change one part of it, not mm -hmm. have to change the whole thing. So if we see, you know, we'll take a look at the piston, we'll look at the coloring on it. Mm, don't have the right activity over here. Let's go change that over there. Right. You know, if I got to do a little welding, that takes a little time out of it. But uh, we can make changes pretty pretty rapidly. We can have a off the engine, machine, and back on there two and a half hours. Wow! Right, two and a half hours. That's that's pretty impressive. You got to do what you got to do. do. Right, exactly. Yeah. If you don't do it, somebody's going to do it to you. Well, and, and to that point, I think about the people that you raced against during what, you know, many consider the golden era of pro stock, you know, in the 1980s when I started to become a conscious <laughs> person, you know, there's Bob Glidden's out there, Ray or Morrison's out there, so many, and you guys were in a, uh, a development race away from the track. Like, that's what they say about Bob is that they, they, they worked themselves, I don't want to say to death, but they worked all the time. And you had, to keep up with them, you had to be doing the same thing, like running through manifolds, running through cylinder heads. What was that experience like, knowing that you know you're going to the track to beat these guys? They're trying to beat you. You're trying to earn a living, and the only way to do it was to just work, develop, and problem solve. Yeah, well, that's why I took a more of an analytical approach to it than probably most of the people. <clears throat> it saved a lot of a lot of work because I was a sh already short enough the way I was, so <laughs> let's not <laughs> endanger myself. So we do a lot of thinking, and we kept impeccable records of what we did. And so it kind of gave us a leg up on a lot of people that did the shotgun method of development where they just kept blasting away until they hit something that was better. Well, that uh, end result records, is that we all got to the same place, some just took longer to get there. Well, keeping the methodical records, that's really important because if you don't really document what you did, your mind will fill in oh, blanks yeah. that yeah. didn't exist. Yeah, it'll it'll lie to you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you you, you got to go back and know. Okay, I, this is the change I made. I documented this, and this is what it was. And because I was, yeah, if you just rely on your own memory, like I said it'll lie to you. Oh yeah, big time. Well, we talk about it a, a, a fairly amount of, uh, amount of time on on hitting horsepower, and like a concept that isn't ready because of the technology of the time. Like sometimes you have to double back to it like it didn't work then and you went down a road and you, you got to a dead end and it didn't work but now there's all these different materials process etc which all of a sudden that dream you had in say 1985 couldn't work then maybe in 1995 it can work maybe in 2005 it can work oh you're absolutely correct uh, you make one significant change one change but there's all this uh, periphery stuff that has an effect on it so that's where the thinking comes in of where you okay this didn't work the way I thought it was gonna work so first of all you grab a mirror and you can find out where the problems at you just look at yourself and what the hell was I thinking and then you go back and work your way back through it and you can eventually and there's a lot of times that there's no way you went out on that branch so far and it's gonna break off but uh, you'll find out to a certain extent okay this didn't work because this component over here wasn't in sync with it. You have to realize this whole thing is a a combination. All we're talking about is an air pump, and you got to get everything in sync for it to be correct so, or maximum efficiency. Right. And sometimes there's an accident. Like Roy Johnson was here earlier. I don't know if you were able to watch or listen, but I asked him just very curiously about their dominance at Vandermeer Speedway because they had such great cars up mm -hmm. there and Alan had now I know you know he lied to me 
Right. <laughs> okay, now I know. Really? Alan, you Shock. Lie. No. He, 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 he you got to watch him, Mopar guy. Uh, yeah, you know that better than anybody, uh -huh. by the way. Great part of the book, by the way. Anyway, um, it was an accident. It was a happy accident that he figured out that they needed to like over gear on the mountain. And he's like, oops, look at us. And they went out and won like four in a row. Anything like that happen with you ever? Happy accident? Stumble upon something that turned out to be great? Nothing of any great uh, significance. Uh, I, I really can't say of anything that all of a sudden uh, one of those uh, aha moment, moments. Sure. Nah, I really can't recall any of it like that. But uh, to Roy's uh, benefit, he was at least aware of where they were. And the accident got him there, but he understood where he was. And Okay, that change got us here. I have to give him credit for that. Yes. Right. So I think it's the unintended consequences is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I, I got this part designed. I didn't right? mean to pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I, I, I intended this to happen, and I did that. I made that change, but the unintended consequence over here is what actually made it a negative mm -hmm. in the end. So what are what are some of you have any unintended consequences that just stick in your mind like oh god I, I, that was a lesson that i learned the hard way and i'll never forget it that, that you can't share nothing of <laughs> real significance i mean we made a lot of chassis changes uh, that mm -hmm. produce negative results but yeah back then you have to uh, remember that was in the 90s we didn't have all this shock technology that we have nowadays uh, basically we had a Coney electric shock and that was it you couldn't even revelve the thing yourself so uh, if you made any changes on the suspension that affected that shock negatively it could be pretty drastic yeah and you don't want to have that going when you're going down the track that's probably yeah. not a good thing man it makes it interesting once in a while I, I wonder and you know people who watch pro stock and you know they don't have fire coming out they don't make 11,000 horsepower but to me it's like all these different racers out there battling for two or three horsepower the effort that goes in i just don't think the average person or fan understands or could possibly conceive of the effort that goes in so like for instance carburetors you ran with carburetors all those years as much as you wanted to change the fuel injection they didn't they didn't do it and probably a mistake i think everybody admits now it would be interesting to see where we were but the effort in getting the right carburetors like it's not just we go buy a carburetor or two carburetors. Like, how many carburetors did you go through to find the right carburetors? That why were they right compared to the one that's on the table? Well, we didn't buy a lot of carburetors. We'd start with a basic Holly product and made a lot of modifications to them. And sometimes they were a gain, sometimes it was a negative. But you learned all the time, and that was the interesting part. You could make a carburetor do as crude as a carburetor is I mean it's like a a globe valve on the dash you kind of open up and it's supposed to flow some fuel in the engine a carburetor is always behind times mm -hmm. for the fuel requirements that's why you have to run it over rich because by the, the time it, the signal gets there the engine's another 100 rpm higher 200 rpm who knows what so it's always behind times so you're trying to coerce this mechanical contraption into, in, into closing that gap closing that gap and it, it, hmm. I yeah. guarantee we weren't the only shop that was making all kinds of uh, unusual parts and pieces uh, there's enough carburetor gurus out there that made a lot of stuff and you know I'd, I'd look at some of it and dismiss the majority of it and it was a, a very interesting time but the fuel injection part of it and that was the reason I was a proponent for fuel injection is the fact that we could keep that engine out of trace detonation basically all the time right and detonation is where, where all the problems start yeah yeah it's uh, not good if you take a maximize a carbureted engine on the dyno camshaft header whatever you're working on you'll put 35 say 35 hard pulls on it you'll pull the thing apart guarantee you're gonna put eight top rings in it maybe pistons maybe rods if you knock the pin bores out around now we take them apart at two or at a hundred poles pull them apart put the same parts back in it including the rods the aluminum rods and put another hundred poles on it engine life has gone up 
I had originally estimated it probably 30 to 40 percent. No, it's gone up three hundred, three or four hundred percent. Wow! Wow! That's that, that's that's massive. Yeah. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Right. It really is. It's kind of hard to, hard to even kind of really comprehend that. Yeah. It's like you just throw that number out like that. It's like wait, wait. That that's that's it's orders of magnitude, right? Yeah. It's yeah. not detonating, so it's not trying to kill itself. And that's where you have to run the carburetors because you have to run them over rich. And if you ever got behind the eight ball, trouble in River City. Yeah, no doubt. But think of all the money that um, could have been saved. Oh, we could have cured the national debt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think this is great. And uh, when did you design the DRCE engine? Because I find it to be interesting that that is still the standard. And there's multiple versions and some that I talked to, you know, the two, the three, the four, uh, and people have their preferences. But your design is still the standard in NHRA Pro Stock now, and it doesn't seem to be, like, that's it, the final evolution. I designed the first one in 1983. That was the DRCE-1, <clears throat> and that was done in such a rapid fashion that the quality of the castings was not what you see today by any stretch of the imagination. So I re redesigned the cylinder head in it was 89, 89, 90, somewhere around there. It was the two head, but it was on a 4840 bore space. And at that point in time, uh, probably about 85 or 86, uh, we started working with Caterpillar to uh, pour the compacted graphite right. blocks. Oh yeah, compacted graphite, yeah, big I deal. spent about a summer up at uh, Peoria, Illinois at Caterpillar. <clears throat> and that's still a block of preference right now because the material was so good. Right. Well, I redesigned a three, which technically it's a far superior block, but GM bean counters decided to go to, over to another uh, facility to have them cast. And the material is so bad in there, you can't get the thing to seal. You can mm. fix it by sleeving it and whatnot, but you're just still putting bandages on it. But RPM-wise, the three is really the engine if you want to run RPM. Okay. I mean, it's funny you said that about the CG being different in different places. And Andy Rotler mentioned that earlier. Is it just because it's a a material doesn't mean it's all the same? Nope. At all. Um, we we saw some things at, at Gibbs between where the GM compacted graphite stuff came from for NASCAR versus the Toyota compacted well, graphite. There were just differences in those engines and how they honed and things like that. And so I, I think, I mean, that's kind of a path. Talk about that development of metallurgy and what that's meant to that three or 400% increase. I mean, I know some of that's, like I said EFI, but how much of the role do you think that material technology well, we're, is. we're still using the original three blocks because like I said technically they're a, a superior piece mm -hmm. but a lot of them got sleeves in them all eight cylinders are sleeved in it and you just learn to work around it because RPM wise uh, you can make it work uh, significantly better than the mm -hmm. two block even the four block is another misted a stillborn engine from GM uh, whoever got involved in the design of that uh, should not be drawing air anymore. <laughs> uh, so talk about oh, you said wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, so wh why did CG, why, what makes CG better than gray cast iron for what you do? It's basically a form of ductile iron mm -hmm. where it's got a lot more elongation in it. Mm -hmm. You can get it uh, in some cases harder than uh, the conventional gray iron blocks. Uh, ductile iron the carbon uh, particles, graphite, are spherical. Little little ball bearings running mm -hmm. every place. CG looks like a bunch of little hot dogs in there with round ends on it. Right. And the, the, the CG blocks, they've got a certain time period that they have to be poured in. Otherwise, that starts to separate. Okay. The metallurgy mm -hmm. uh, starts to change. And uh, the three blocks, uh, where they were poured was barely above a horseshoe foundry. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, I know Caterpillar did the work for Dodge on the NASCAR blocks when they came in. I remember at Melling, we got the first block in 
the ship to or ship from address was Caterpillar up in Peoria. Yeah, that's who they understood their CG because they were willing to work on that because they they had such a problem with the inline six Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. If you crack one of them, you got to replace the whole head. Hum, uh, Cummings had three two cylinder heads on it. So you break one of them, you just replace oh, yeah, yeah, a third yeah. of it. All right. And they were looking for a better material, and they figured, you know, racers they can take them break a cannonball with a rubber hammer in a sandbox. Mm -hmm. So let's play, play see this if game. they can ruin this thing. Yeah. And they, it, I guess it was an education for them at, at the same time. And they were more interested in perfecting the pouring of the CG materials. Right. And uh, that's that's what kind of made the two block the favorite for such a long time. A, it had been around for a long time and there was a plentiful supply of them. Was it the first compacted graphite block in like professional racing? Uh, if you're talking about just drag racing, probably for, for, for certainly for drag racing. What what year was that? CG, the first one. It was about eighty six or seven, somewhere in that okay. era. Yeah. I would think that probably predates some NASCAR stuff too. Then probably. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'd had NASCAR shops uh, calling Kirk trying to figure out how to own this stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. About a dozen years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, and that exactly, and that, and why was the four uh, stillborn? Like, so here you are, you're designing, and I, I you know, I'm thinking. Oh, I didn't have any input on the four. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, everything that could be done wrong on it, they did. Let's put it that way. Oh well, I, you know, here. Professor. Although they went to Granger and Worrell in England, and they got good material, so that's the only saving grace of it. But in the perfect world, the three with good material would oh. be. Be the block of choice. Would be the block of choice. Have Granger and Worrell pour the three, and you're good. Yep, absolutely. Wow. Because they're really good at it. I mean, I said that's kind of their yeah, expertise. One of the best in the world, yeah. all the stuff I've seen from them. So to, uh, down that same path of material technology, talk about coatings. What 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 role has coatings played in engine development? Well, you know, that that's a, a question relating to that. Is probably the most common question I got. You know, how fast can these car, uh, cars go? How quick can they go? I said, it's, there's only two factors that determine that. This and material. That's it. Yeah. Now, we were probably one of the leading teams uh, to investigate a lot of strange materials. Mm -hmm. But there was a gains to be made if you had the right material for the application. A lot of right. people say, oh, titanium, that's the magic material. No, titanium has got its place. Mm -hmm. Magnesium got it, has had its place. I mean, there's a, the right material for the application is what you need. Right, exactly. Back to the thinking through what you're doing. Yeah. And what is this material supposed to accomplish? Right. What is it going to do better than what I've got been using for 40 years? Yeah the uh, unobtainium uh, aspect of it but you know everybody talking about uh, one thing I, I would like to add to that and, and get your opinion is you know like dollars right like how much is someone willing to put forth so that you can use your mind to find these incredible dump, tr dump right? trucks full of money right like that's <laughs> that's a huge number I would imagine. getting materials uh, it's not well we've had some uh, strategic materials simply from the fact I have clearance to get it and it's common nowadays but re in reality it wasn't that much more expensive I mean as they change alloys whatnot you know any aluminum al aluminum alloys uh, basically are pretty much the same yeah, as the material cost isn't no. dramatic it's the research and development cost to figure out and how then, to, how to then some of them you get into the machining cost oh my Ooh, god we've had yeah. some materials Whew. trying to figure out how to machine it was almost impossible but you know we muddled our way through it but uh, there's just because you change materials a it's not going to be magic it's going to help if it's applied right but then you got the machining process that yeah you there's some, that out. something to do yeah yet, yet another learning curve we've had to work with companies to get Cutter inserts to machine some of this stuff because conventional inserts just won't even touch it. Right. So, 
And, and where, it's an education. Right. Well, CG, right? So like you said, yeah. the people were calling, Kurt, how do I hone this stuff? Because yeah, CG hones completely different than oh, gray cast iron. Enough. Yep. And so where did you go when you were trying to find the next material? You know, with aerospace, were you calling NASA? Were you going to come like th that detective work of where to find the next element like there had to be some effort put in there or did people approach you don't have you? to buy all that material in this country you know there's a whole world out there that makes materials so but but to find those people though like that you know while you're racing like are you hunting down are people uh, approaching uh, you like hey we got something that could work i've had a certain uh, uh, amount of that and uh, because i'm always interested in looking at different things but you ha kind of have to have an idea okay this is not this particular material is not doing what I think a better material should do or could do. So what encompasses a different material? That's what you, you got to find the right people for that. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I, I know just a little side story when we were doing some of the oil development that you guys actually helped us te yep. do testing with. I would go to this, they, they call it the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers Annual Conference. And I would sit in on all these presentations, like every 30 minutes of the different presentation, all day long for three days. And I would go find different ones and I would mm -hmm. listen because I knew from a material perspective what I wanted, but I didn't know where to find it. So I would just go listen and listen and listen. And every once in a while you'd be oh wait, this, is, this guy is talking about a material or a property that I'm looking for. So I wait for the room clear out and then go give them a business card and say, this is who, who I am, who I work for, what I'm trying to do. Can I get some of this stuff? You know, some of that stuff actually made it into the oils we tested. Yeah, some of that oil you sent over was, was always lab, uh, labeled CP. I thought that meant crock pot. Yeah, it did, yeah, <laughs> yeah, CPO, crock pot oil. <laughs> you know, because it was back to the super secret, right? We didn't want anybody knowing about it. So we literally had little bitty tiny lab. We could make little bitty batches and you got to heat it up so one way I found heated up is putting a crock pot, which I picked that up from alcohol fuel guys. Yes. There's a lot of alcohol dragster guys yes. that will drain their oil and after a pass into a crock pot to get it hot enough to cook off the methanol uh -huh. and they pour it back in. That's where I picked it up. I'm like, man, I want to go spend, you know, fifteen hundred dollars on a heated kettle. I can go down to Walmart and buy one for like thirty nine dollars and get the job done. Man, I'm going to Walmart, you know. <laughs> Let's do it. Qualified to make a still now. Yes. Hey, you know, I, I, like I, I, I like where your head's at. I like where your head's at. It's chemistry. I like it, you know. That's, uh, what, what about these days? Uh, I am under the impression you're doing some autocross stuff. Um, what keeps you busy? I know you still have the pro stock. I'm not going to hit you with, when you coming back, Warren? We want to <laughs> see you back, Warren. You know we all want to see you back, Warren. Can't you know, make any money at it anymore. I know, but what about, come on, that last Atlanta race, we heard you were, like, thinking about it. The, oh, I think about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, it just, it doesn't interest me to the level that it did before. And if we, we did, uh, you know, decide to enter a car, we'd more than likely put Kurt in it. And so I'd, we'll play around with it. I've got two cars. I've got one converted over to the EFI format, and uh, we'll probably go someplace and test. And it would make a lot of people happy. Oh, it was could make a lot of people sad. It could make some people sad, a lot of people happy. I'm sure Kurt would love it. And your fans, think of all the books you'd sell. You got to be commercial about everything. Huh? Yes. Hey, this is America, <laughs> right? Capitalist uh, society. Absolutely. Let's make. At least a, it still is. Absolutely. Uh, but what about the autocross? Like you're delving into other things. Like with your time, you're you're getting into, uh, you know, what are you getting into? Well, the autocross thing. I mean, it's an NA motor, kind of. a attracts me to build something like that uh, you know I'm competing against the uh, Lingenfelters and Mast and all these guys uh, and it, it's just interesting to me uh, from the standpoint that okay how much power can we make that's uh, usable mm -hmm. and you have to understand the format that they're racing under and build engine to that we're not trying to build something that turns 10,000 rpm and makes you know a thousand horsepower because it's totally useless you got to build something they can drive out there because i think the fastest straightaway is probably 60 feet oh yeah i don't know yeah, what it right, is you know? right but it's uh 
So a lot of par throttle. That's the interesting part. They keep asking me for more power. But every time we look at the ECU, they're never past 70% throttle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But it's a it's a fun uh, thing for us, uh, you know. And they're and they're doing well at it. So. Something else, I said, another project, another path to go explore. And I'm sure there's probably nowhere near as many rules and regulations around that so far. Uh, yeah, it's pretty loose as far as uh, rules and regulations. So it's, uh, rule books have always fascinated me from the standpoint. Uh, it'll tell you what you uh, can't do, but it doesn't tell you what you can do. And there's lines, you know, there's open space between every one of them lines. Mm -hmm. That's open for interpretation. That's the important part of the rule book and is I, what's not there. I never broke a rule. I put a lot of stress fractures in them. <laughs> But it never blatantly broke a rule. Yeah, I, I think that that's part of the fun of racing is getting that rule book and figuring out what you can oh, do yeah. that's not there. That's the great part. And you know, we did one of the episodes of Hidden Horsepower with Larry Wallace, you know, NASCAR guy who did mm -hmm. the Pisky Ford stuff. And, and I, to me, when I told him one of the greatest compliments was that. Um, Gary Nelson said, you know, most of these are yours. <laughs> yes. You're like, that. <laughs> that's what you want. It's like, okay, if you're tallying up who's the greatest NASCAR engine builder, well, most of the, those rules got an LW next to it. Well, all right, then that, that you means you did, you did your job. Got other people to think. Right. That's all it was. Well, talk back to you earlier about the sounds and stuff. That was one of the things that he mentioned was that before they had a Spintron, you know, they, they had an engine that they would hook up to run the other engine when it's not firing. And they could hear the valve train. I, I get, I mean, that was an era that they still had wood spoke wheels in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, the Spintron was invented because it was a useful tool. There was other prede uh, predecessors to that mm -hmm. that were very crude, didn't collect a whole lot of information, like you say, just the audible part of it. Uh, so that tool evolved into what is a Spintron nowadays. And uh, there's really other tools out there that have come about by wanting to gain more knowledge of what's going mm -hmm. on. Is that, was that one of the more valuable tools you think to come along for what you were doing in, in NA engines? It, uh, it's a useful tool. It's better than your uh, flow bench, right? Oh, <laughs> I, I don't even need a flow bench. <laughs> You need a flow bench. How in the heck do you get a seat belt on that flow bench so you can race the thing? <laughs> well, so back to what Roy was saying earlier, or was it Kazi? I forget what it was. One of them was saying that you know that's that they had to learn not to trust the dyno all the time. Yeah, just like a flow bench, you have to learn. Okay, that what I'm getting out of there is not even usable. Just because that thing flows more air, it's not going to make any more power. And right. you have to figure out what those nuances are. Yeah. Learn what, what it, it's not telling you. Yeah, because a flow bench, basically, I haven't seen a flow bench that's been built uh, correctly. Uh, the only one I ever saw that was correct was a Smoky Unic one. Okay, yeah, I've heard about that one and written his book. Yeah. Well, that's appropriate that Smoky got it right. So, wind it down. Pro stock. We love it. 500 cubic inches now since 1982 got this kind of arc a lot of people thought it was dead a few years ago the two major teams kind of got together and, and came up with a way to save it now we got 20 cars per race and all but 650s or so 210 miles an hour like has it evolved to its pinnacle is it should they change something Where, where's your thought on the class that you spend so much time involved in no they haven't uh, gotten to the pinnacle yet uh, based off what I've seen because in five years four years <clears throat> they're still running at exactly the same speed and ETs going back to a standard correction so that means they haven't developed any more power at all that's usable maybe on their dyno they did but that result when you look at that time card hmm, that ain't working so you know based on that uh, there's still plenty of uh, opportunity out there well going back but you have to factor, think about it right because i remember spending some time at gary's stint shop one night and his notebooks 
of correction factor and how detailed he has to be. In fact, one of the things of knowing not what to believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, look deep in those numbers, not just look at the surface of them. Because I mean, think about it, Dallas, how much it changed from a morning session to the afternoon session. I mean, there Absolutely. was, what, 300s, 400s? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you're depending on Mother Nature. Right. Do you watch the races? Do you like when NHRA is on, Pro Stock is on? Are yeah, you we'll, out there we'll watch them at the shop. I'll turn the TV on while I'm working. And keep up there's something this. interesting, I'll check it out. That's good to know. Yeah. That's why you got to keep up with it, right? Like, that's the... The reason yeah. you're here. If it wasn't pro stock, what would it have been? If you didn't go down that road, there was another road. There's another, another something. Probably been an aeronautical engineer. Interesting. You watch uh, Formula One at all? Once in a while. Uh, the difference there, they don't count their money, they just weigh it. <laughs> so we really can't wait, relate uh, relate yeah, to it. Yeah, exactly. But as far as the technology and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, and I've had some brushes with them people. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting. It, it is. It's uh, still something with four tires on it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, like what they did with the in the turbo era here with like Mercedes when they split the turbo. That's back to that some of the innovative things. Mm -hmm. Like that was a really cool idea. It's That's like a cool idea. Take split a turbo. Well, you, first thing you have to remember, I'm doing it this way. Is that the only way it can be done? Right. Chance for innovation. It mm -hmm. didn't say you couldn't split it. Yeah. The rules didn't, didn't say that. Let's go go for it. Yeah. yeah. You don't know until you try it. Right. And that was a huge innovation. They dominated with that. What about the space race? You know, today Captain Kirk went to space, right? We, I, I'm sure we've all been kind of enthralled with that. You mentioned aeronautical engineer, like civilians going to space, rockets landing on pads, moving on the water. Like, that's all pretty amazing. What is your take on all of that, what's happening? Well, it's the evolution of people's quest for knowledge of trying to uh, do different things. I'm not saying all of it is going to be usable. You know, some of those uh, people that go out in space, they should just keep going, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just... Uh, if we ever get to the point that we don't try something new, what the heck's the sense of being awake even? I love it. It's kind of a common thread, isn't it, Joe? All these guys that have accomplished those things, there's a restlessness, right? You just... Oh, we accomplish this. Well, damn, if you were really bright, you would accomplish all of that. <laughs> right. and, and that brings us back to the beginning, not like what to think about, but how to think of a process, how to think, where to go, where to let your mind go. You, you gotta, you have to think in every dimension possible because you got so many different materials, different applications, what you're trying to accomplish, is it the right way of trying to accomplish that? There's so many av avenues of trying different things and people by their very nature you know, they don't want to pay taxes and they don't want to change either. So, I mean, it's it's a case that you got to be able, uh, got to want to try something. Right. Because doing the same thing every uh, every day the same way, you know, God, they got monkeys for that. Yeah. Except for going for Mexican on Tuesday. That's what I'm thinking. That's, right? yes. I, I didn't say they were monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I have a question. So Steve Burns, right, the guy that did VP. So tell, tell us about that evolution, because that's another company that just kind of changed massively with fuel. I, mean, I feel like fuel has been one of those big changes in racing. Well, that was, uh, Steve was probably the right person at, at the right time for that and uh, he would bring his horse trailer over all the way from texas with all these chemicals in there and <laughs> i've heard of these stories so go on they'd yeah be, they'd be mixing this stuff up back there and they'd be pulling the dyno up hell till six o'clock in the morning when i got back there the next uh, morning mm -hmm. and sometimes they hit a home run sometimes they had all ground balls and right. it, but that wasn't a question of trying to build a better fuel and a lot of cases the VP is a great fuel if you use it for the right application yeah but it was so prone to trace detonation uh, the only 
people that absolutely love them were the spark uh, plug manufacturers because <laughs> we'd lose the ground strap at least off six or seven plugs every race if, if you were trying to run it on the edge so that's funny so i i yeah, heard stories about him you know come around and like literally have like a space suit because i mean when you're dealing with tetra lead like one drop will kill you dead if you touch it so he would be out there blending this stuff in the oh, trailer yeah. with his spacesuit like uh, george bryce was telling me this story which he'll maybe may share tomorrow right he literally walks out there and sees him with this spacesuit and he's like i probably shouldn't have seen that right he said no 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 you don't want to know what's in here oh, <laughs> dioxane <laughs> all right we're going to continue on this is not it for warren johnson in fact we're going to have a round table discussion but for this segment we are concluded warren this has been fantastic is there anything we didn't get to that you want to bring up no, not that I can think of. You, you're the ones that are I in control we're, of this program. This guy with questions, oh, yeah. peppering Warren. We, we wore him out, right? Throwing in curveballs, fastballs, but it's not over yet because we got a roundtable discussion. John Callies and others. Scooter Brother going to be here. It's going to be great. So stick around, gentlemen. In fact, you can head over to the the big roundtable discussion. Warren, thank you so much. This has you're been welcome. tremendous, and thank you for sharing so much. And I recommend everyone get the book available on Amazon.com. It is a bestseller. It's in its second rendition. So many details about Warren's life. Things that we couldn't possibly get uh, to here. Just great stuff. Uh, Warren, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, sir.